Hi, I'm Jackie Glazier. And I'm Don Paul Kale. We are the clarinet and saxophone ensemble duo Entre Nous. Our mission is to commission new works for clarinet and saxophone duo and advocate for new music. We are excited to be releasing our debut album in May 2021 of works we have commissioned from some amazing composers. We are here today with one of those composers, Kei Ha. Kei Ha is originally from China, where she studied at the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing. Kei is currently on the faculty at the University of Arizona in Tucson and is the founder of the Turn Up Festival for Equality. Kay specializes in electronic music with live instruments and is also an accomplished visual and video artist. She often incorporates visual elements into her compositions. She composed the work Foam and Sun for Du Entre Nous in 2019 for B-flat clarinet, alto saxophone, and live electronics. Hi Kay, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you? Doing well. We'd love to start by hearing about your background in music and how you got started with composition. All right. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Kei He. Just like many, um, you know, Asian kids, I started learning piano when I was five. And uh, when I was 12, I got into this teenager uh, rebel stage where I really hated practice. Um, I was just you know, making up things on a piano. And while I was 13, I was so determined that I want to be a composer. At first, my parents were really confused and didn't really understand how this profession will work. Um, writing music for a living is not an easy career and still doesn't really make sense to a lot of people. But after I did some research, I finally convinced my parents and this is what I want to do. And, um, you know, I already made up my mind. Then they became very supportive. Um, I got into Shenyang Conservatory affiliated high school when I was 15. After three years formal training of music composition, I got to the Central Conservatory in Beijing which uh, is the top music institution in China. When I came to the US, um, I got my master degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and also my doctoral degree from the University of Texas at Austin. That's so interesting. I love to hear about all the different places you've been <laughs> and all the things you've learned. What were some challenges that you faced on uh, early on when you were developing your career? Um, yeah, so writing music, as I mentioned, writing music is uh, for a living to earn money. <laughs> it's not a very easy job. And it's really odd enough that people always laugh at me when they hear that I'm a composer and this is my profession. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, it's a very competitive field and with very uh, limited support system, especially for um underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. As musicians, we truly believe in music and really love music so deeply. Um, we wouldn't have music as a career if we have a single percent of doubt about it. So I really hope that eventually the new music field could reach more audience and gain more support and understanding. I, I appreciate that and I appreciate all the work you're doing <clears throat> with your festival to uh, you know, try to give visibility to, um, to women and to underrepresented groups. I think it's so important. So it's really wonderful. You. Do you have any advice for um, young composers who are starting out their careers? Young composers. Yeah, I was young, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So the road, um, can be really bumpy and sometimes it seems like an endless tunnel without any light ahead. Um, but believe in yourself that, you know, you're doing uh, really amazing jobs and, uh, you know, writing music and being artists is truly beautiful. Don't try so hard to copy other composers' musical language just because they're famous or it's 
very trendy at that time. Uh, learning the skill and the techniques from them to develop a unique voice of yourself. Um, having a unique voice, I believe, is the most valuable quality that a composer should have. Yeah, that's really fantastic advice for young composers. And I think that that's really the one of the most important things for someone to really be able to capture their own voice and to really like, you know, profit from it and to say, this is who I am and to be happy to, to say that and proud to say that. I'd love to talk about your creative process. What inspires you? Uh, well, as a composer, <laughs> a lot of things in life inspire me, um, such as nature, art, travel, and uh, connections between people, relationships with others, beautiful things, ugly things, regular things, maybe weird things even. So I tend to pay attention to details, and often those details just really evoke very strong emotions of mine. And those emotions then become inspirations to my music and also multimedia works. I think I can say most of my works are very personal, very, very personal. And my biggest joy as a composer is to be able to share them uh, with my audience and this really tender part of my heart. <laughs> And I'm curious, you know, what is your process like for developing pieces with live electronics? Uh, it's a, actually um, quite complicated process, but I will just go through it um, okay. in a regular way, if this is the ideal situation. So uh, most of the time I'll start to do research on this instrument setup uh, to figure out what are the unique features of the instruments. Um, especially I like to do research on extended techniques. I love extended techniques because they just bring in such a unique uh, timbre palette into the piece. Um, but I also believe if you are using extended techniques um, without caution or without a purpose, just blinded use them to make your piece look cool or sound cool, mm -hmm. that's probably not going to work for most mm -hmm. of the time. Um, after my research of the instruments, I usually form a um, concept and uh, also have a lot of inspirations that I gain from the process. Um, I will start to write down ideas on both um, live instrument parts and also the electronic part. Eventually, these ideas will form the draft of the piece and then I usually show the score to the performers to get feedbacks from them. Um, I believe commissions are collaborations. A good collaboration should be based on a good communication and a deep understanding from all the teammates, in this case are both composers and also musicians. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do a recording session with the performers based on this draft score. And the next stage will be editing. So I will uh, bring all of the recorded material back to my studio and recompose the piece by using those recorded materials and finalize the electronic portion, such as um, processing the samples and the programming, the live effects, and then finalize the final score. Um, what, as I mentioned, that what I described above are uh, these ideal situations. Sometimes a certain steps will need to be repeated just for the best outcome. And you know, all the artists are perfectionists. <laughs> and uh, but you know, I know no one can be perfect, but artists are always trying to get as close to perfect as possible. So that's just you know, our nature. <laughs> wow, what, yeah. what an incredible process. I'm, you know, just, you know, amazed by how you really delve into the, the whole process of, with the performers and also like with, with the instrument, the research on the, te the technique and the extended techniques. It must, you know, take many, many hours and, you know, quite a long time to get that palette of everything that you need and, 
you know, it's really astounding actually. And then, you know, I think a lot of composers would be interested to know how you, you know, how you get out of a rut. So, you know, like, you know, a writer's block or like something like this. Do you have any <laughs> advice for that? <laughs> yeah, so different composers have different ways to deal with their writer's block. Um, for me, I, what I do is actually quite simple. So I just kind of put down what I'm stuck with and go out to do something else that can be light and inspiring, such as going to a park, take a walk and uh, attending a concert before COVID and going to an exhibition, right? And uh, now you could go to for a hike since I'm in Tucson, Arizona and uh, having a great conversation, you know, with your friends and et cetera. So during this kind of like break, you know, from my writer's block uh, period, um, my mind actually never really stops thinking about this piece. Mm. And there always are some light bulb moments during this um, uh, rest of break time. So um, when I come back from, you know, all those, um, you know, walks or hikes or anything that I was doing to kind of get inspiration and to the composition that I'm writing, the piece I'm writing again, um, the idea usually just come out naturally. Mm -hmm. So it does, I don't really force it to get specific idea go through. I simply just put it on the side and try to do something else and then come back most of the time the block will just go away. <laughs> That's so great. I mean, I'm so jealous that you can just, you know, take take a, a moment and and go out in the desert and go on a hike. I mean, I really truly miss that. And every time I'm in Tucson, I totally take advantage of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really inspiring to see all the other things that you do and to see that you're taking photos in, in the most beautiful places out there. It's that's in, that inspires me a lot. Um, yeah, photography also inspire my work a lot. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have a bit of a different kind of question then. How do you stay true to your unique style while also creating variety in your work, okay? Um, so unique style and varieties. So for because I truly believe that most valuable quality for a composer is his or her own voice, right? As I mentioned before. So young and emerging composers always really try hard to learn and copy a specific style in time just because it was very trendy. And um, a long time, um, some of them may just lost their identity as a composer, um, but some of, of the young composers were very smart and never gave up their unique um, musical language instead for many of after many many years they eventually establish their own style the own voice so um, which they connected with very deeply and that they will be able to use the specific style to um, really express themselves effectively um, so I also have a a very different opinion on that. Just wanted to make sure that uh, it's all clear. And um, so because as a person, I so also, you know, for me, I'm very adventurous. I believe a lot of artists are, and I have a strong willingness to try new things. So I found a specific style usually this kind of like style or, you know, format, I would say that could reflect my, um, you know, specific emotion expressions at that moment I was composing the piece. Um, I believe in establishing a unique voice as a composer rather than fixing themselves as a specific style. So I don't really like the word about style because it's such a generic word right so mm -hmm. i would like to say that it's more about a composer's voice right yeah so um just like being an artist that has you know with very different but very profound deep emotions and the artist can create very different artworks 
very in many different styles. But at the same time, we are be able to identify the artists by their works, right? But why is that, right? So um, as a result of this belief, so I have a lot of different pieces and using very different compositional techniques in very, very different styles and media to express those very different concepts and emotions that I have as a composer. It's a fascinating dichotomy, the, the two on, on either side that you can support it and go against it at the same time, while <laughs> having that, you know, strong willed, uh, you know, understanding of it. I like that a lot, actually. I also like the idea of artists being adventurous. I think that's important, yeah. especially for right. young people, you know. Right. Yeah. Get out there, right? Yeah. Um, well, I'd love to talk about Foam and Sun. It's such a beautiful piece and it's just so much fun to play. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the story behind the piece? Sure. Uh, Foam and Sun was inspired by Chinese mythology and called the Jingwei, feeling the sea. Um, Jingwei is the name of the character of in the um, Chinese mythology. She was the youngest daughter of Emperor Yan, Yan Di, which is in Chinese. Um, so he was a legendary ruler of the primitive China. Um, and uh, his daughter, um, Jing Wei, she perished, died uh, at a very young age in the East Sea. So just before she was buried by the surging waves, her spirit turned to a very beautiful bird. And the when um, she flew away um, from the roaring sea, and uh, she cried very sadly in the sound of Jingwei, Jingwei. That's why people heard the sound and named her after uh, Jingwei. Um, the bird lived on a mountain near by the sea, and Jingwei doesn't really want the sea to end more lives, so she had a very ambitious decision. She decided to fill it up by carrying twigs and pebbles from the mountain and drop them into the sea, trying to fill up the sea. Um, this um, describes people who have a um, very strong and um, very unbeatable spirit that they are formed and determined and will never really give up on their goals, no matter how ridiculous their goals that others think about, right? So I want this piece to be my artistic outlet to tell my story as a foreign born artist living and working in the US and also to really form a voice that represents those who are fighting for the true equality of humankind. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And very deep. So yeah. Thank it's, you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, so what was your experience like writing for a clarinet and saxophone duo? It's an unusual combination. And um, how did you incorporate extended techniques into the work? Okay. So um, it's very challenging actually to tell a Chinese story by using Western instruments, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in this piece, I use the Chinese pentatonic scales as the harmonic language, and I use the rapid grace notes and, you know, falling off ending on a long nose, like a bending tones, to really mimic the crying of the birds, the bird. And it's very sad, but it sounds so strong, so determined. Um, I explored the uh, temporal potentials of both clarinet and saxophone and integrate them, um, you know, uh, with, the elect uh, with the electronic music and also the extended techniques to really break the boundary and the limitation of these two instruments. Um, so I use uh, the electronics in two different uh, purpose. One purpose is to prolong and expand the dimension of the instruments. And then the second purpose is to really enhance and dramatize the spatial world of the performance, like adding reverbs and making the space larger than you could ever imagine. 
Um, this approach really provide me a unique way to create a vivid sonic world of this ancient China that we are not really familiar with that we created and as uh, in an artistic form. I, I think that that's really interesting now that you say that because, um, you know, we are somewhat limited in that we're two wind acoustic instruments that are quite similar, um, right. but your piece in particular has quite a, a depth to it, um, the way that you incorporated the, um, the electronics especially, so um, it feels almost orchestral in scope, you know, it's much, much bigger um, because of that, so it's really interesting that you were thinking of that when you were writing it. Um, can you talk about some of the techniques you used in the electronics part in the piece? Yeah, sure. Um, so as you know, um, you know, writing for solo or duet uh, live instruments with electronic sounds is one of my specialty. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a it's a media that I really love to work with. It, it breaks the limitation of the acoustic instruments and adds new sound palette to the piece. And there are two ways. And as I mentioned, to um, really organize the acoustic instruments and also the electronics. Uh, the first one is to use electronic sound as prolongations of the clarinet and also saxophone. Um, expanding the dimensions of the acoustic instrument. In a piece, I try to uh, join the acoustic duet and the electronic medium to create a super duet, right? So you put two, you know, um, the live instrument, acoustic instrument together and combine with all the electronic mediums and create a super duet. And such as this um, process, um, you know, I use a lot of uh, uh, pre-recorded clarinets and saxophone sound to intertwine with the live sound, the live instruments. In this case, the audience won't really recognize what is real and what is the electronics. What is the live music? What is the electronics? Um, another example is um, on top of using extended techniques of the live instruments, I added a synthesized percussive sound to really emulate those extended techniques in order to create a big extended techniques ensemble, like a super extended technique ensemble. So this technique add a lot of energy in the traditional setting of the acoustic duet. Mm. So the second way, there is another way that I use electronics. Um, it's to enhance the spatial world of the piece. The electronics effect create a surround, um, you know, really surreal and the immersive um, spatial environment to compensate and really dramatize the fixed acoustic space that we have in a concert hall. Um, and also enhance the depth and the spatial world of the piece to bring the music into a different world. In this case, it's ancient China. Um, I use uh, Max MSP uh, for this purpose. Max MSP is a um, visual programming language that helps the composer and audio engineers to create interactive sound and also uh, custom effects. A large part of the uh, computer sound came from the live sampling of the acoustic duet, uh, acoustic duet uh, on a stage. So clarinet and saxophone in this case, um, the microphone will pick up the audio signal and then send those signals to the computer. And in a computer, the software Max MSP um, will uh, process the audio input and uh, transform it into a various kind of audio effects and then being sent back mixed with the live sound and then being broadcast into um, all the um, uh, DP system. So, uh, so um, I use a lot of different effects in live effects in this uh, piece. For example, that I use a lot of different reverb, different delay flanger and harmonizer and chorus and also granulation um, are, um, they're really important. I believe it's to really create this 
um, very different world as we what we can experiencing just by using the acoustic instrument. Um, yeah. I, I think your process is so interesting. I know I had a lot of fun recording um, all these different um, little phrases and gestures and um, extended techniques and sounds and then seeing how that ended up into the track and the piece. It was like really very, very, very cool. So thank you. Yeah. Um, is there a particular section of the piece that you really like how it came out? Well, I like all of it. I like all of it. So you guys did an amazing job of performing the piece. Yes, um, I truly appreciate it. Um, all the extended techniques were spotless. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the way that you guys are responding, uh, the electronics and also really conveying your emotions that interacting with each other and also interacting with the electronic sound were perfect and very organic. So as a composer, I'm very pleased. Oh, thank you, Kay. I, I think we also could feel like, you know, the piece really played to who, who we are and are playing. And it's really nice to have have that thought of in the process and, and how you wrote it. So um, it's just, and I know it's already getting a lot of traction in this piece. So it's it's a great, great work. Um, are there um, any advice you would give to composers um, on collaborating with performers and getting their music out there? Yeah, so... <clears throat> From my experience, I know that collaboration can be very hard and frustrating sometimes, especially for younger um, composers, that composers and performers, we all are artists, right? So as we know, the artists are often uh, very stubborn and uh, <laughs> right yes so we always really hold our personal aesthetic value very tightly strongly mm -hmm. collaboration between different artists it's just like collaboration you know between different chefs that <laughs> trying to mixing different spices together and to create this perfect dish right that's kind of like our end goal and uh, it's not possible it's impossible it's impossible that if you just doing your thing and putting all the spice that you would like to put in the meal, it's not going to work that way. If you have to be very open-minded and with your collaborators feedback and opinions. So one suggestion for young composers, um, always be curious and open-minded and be strong, but unique and consider every single collaboration as a learning opportunity from the experts in the field. Then you'll be able to create the most unique and meaningful piece of music for yourself and your collaborators. That's great advice. Well, Kay, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And we hope that everyone will check out and enjoy uh, the recording of Foam and Sun on our album uh, coming soon. And check out more of Kay's music at kayhacomposer.com. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.